of Netflix, where your fearless co-hosts Isaac and Larry force each other to watch the worst pieces of shit on Netflix. We will go over every bad edit, all the broken dialogue, all the wooden acting, and laugh along the way, because this is the Bowels of Netflix! Alright, welcome to the Bowels of Netflix. I am Isaac, and with me as always is my co-host, the man even Leonidas feared, Mr. Larry Beard. How are you doing this week, Larry? Uh, my farts will block out the sun. Shit, shit, I fucked it up. <laughs> fucked it up. Well, at least you can defeat Zool. That's all that matters. Yeah, wait. Z- wasn't that the Yeah, Leonidas song? was um, Bill Murray in Ghostbusters, right? <laughs> Yeah, I think that's what I think that's wait. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. did did Leonidas play Bill Murray or did No, that was a character. He played Leonidas in 300. Bill Murray did, right? Oh, okay. He played Leonidas in 300 as uh Venkman in Ghostbusters. Yeah, and he was Gerard's butler. Like he <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> oh man. I had a whole bit about having a fever planned, and you ruined all of it. Well, do you, do you have a fever? I don't do you have need a fucking, more cowbell? I didn't, I didn't have a bit. No, no, that's just so lame. I thought about that in the drive home today <laughs> for ten seconds and realized, no, that's the lamest bit in existence. I got a fever. I need more cowbell. It's, it's fevers in the water. I don't... <laughs> I, I have... I have so... Like, all of my friends I would do impressions around don't live near me anymore, so I have little occasion to use them. So my you gotta keep your walking up. My walking has gotten so rusty. You gotta speed that walking up. He's gotta be Christopher Trotten, Larry. <laughs> I don't remember if that was you or Josh, but that is the best joke. Yeah. I think that was one of his D&D characters, right? Yeah, yeah he had a horse. He had a horse named Christopher yeah, Trotten. Yeah, right. Yeah. Our yeah, friend, for those of you listening, good. in a D&D game, our friend had a horse he named Christopher Trotten, and I'm still laughing about it like six years later. I was I was trying to describe Josh to some of my in-laws who had never really met him. Mm-hmm. And I was like, he's the smartest person in the world who could do anything, but he chooses to do whatever he wants. <laughs> so therefore, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> it's true. Some mornings he'll wake up and tell me I want to go live at sea, and the next morning I want to be a doctor. It's, it's the best. We, yep. uh, he hates things like this, but we have to get him on this show. At least once. If we get, if I get him drunk, he th- I think yes. I don't think he'll review anything, but I think he'll sit here and harass me while I review. If we get, well, him drunkenly trying to explain any movie to us, even if it's a good movie, would be interesting. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Lord, what but what is what show are we? <laughs> we are uh, last <laughs> podcast on the left. My name's Henry Zabraska. Uh, no. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm clearly Henry Zabarski. I'm fatter than you. I'm usually naked. I'm, my <laughs> conspiracy theories are far crazier than yours. Is this true? I don't do enough research to be Marcus Parks, but maybe I'm just Ben Kissel because he really likes Chinese food, and I right. really like Chinese food. I, how many other podcasts and people's dicks are we going to suck before you talk about ours? We are the bowels of Netflix. <laughs> we are a wonderful podcast where two, I guess we're friends. We're friends, right? Uh, I, by the legal definition of the term, yes. Yeah. We're, um, uh, whoa, well, what's the congenitally married? What? You're my, you're my court, court appointed friend and podcast yes, host. Yes, yes, that's what it is. Um, but yeah, we force each other to watch the worst movies we can find for each other on Netflix, and every week we describe them in horrible, horrible detail, because mm-hmm. we hate ourselves and each other. Yeah. Um, and if you <clears throat> want to tweet us or Facebook poke us, we exist on both of those platforms. Those are both at Bells and Netflix. If you want to send us an email, we do have a Gmail account. It's Bells of Netflix at gmail.com. So you could let us know your thoughts, um, your feelings, any impressions you have, if you had a seizure during any of the episodes, and if you have any suggestions of movies that we could review going forward. Yeah, yeah. Because th- there's a lot to plumb on Netflix, but I- I'm trying to keep the variety up is sometimes hard when there's just so many bad Christian romance movies staring me in you, the face. You can't you can't go down that road again, Larry. I will I will quit. I'll resign. <laughs> Oh, well, that's the story for next week. Oh, golly. I but can't this wait week... to hear about Ja Rule's legal troubles, uh, which you've hinted at, but not told me about. He is a man 
with some problems. <laughs> some hundred million dollar lawsuit <laughs> problems. But anyway, wow. <laughs> what what movie are you talking about this week, Larry? Well, you took a trip down memory lane, and at the end of one, two, three, memory lane is a little cabin. And while it is in the woods, it's not Cabin in the Woods. It's, in fact, Cabin Fever. Got a the fever. 2002 Eli Roth-directed masterpiece. Now, now, I don't he, know anything about Eli Roth. He's he's a big deal in horror. He um, was uh, directed Hostel, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then maybe subsequent Hostels. Oh, he's uh, the Bear the, Jew. Okay. He's he's also the Bear Jew in um, Inglorious Bastards, which is a great movie and a great role. So he gets credit for that. Mm-hmm. All right. I don't. I, I don't know. This this one is this cabin fever. I I don't know what to say about this one. I, there's. I I feel like for once it's actually going to be a short review because I don't have a lot of shit that I really raged about except for one very particular thing, which I'll get into <laughs> in ex- intense detail. But um, this is easily the uh, best rated movie we've we've had on this show. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes yeah. currently has it at sitting at a 63% uh, critical score. Um, a lot of people really like this movie. The audience score is 44%, but I, I, I think I can see why when, when we get into the review. Um, uh, currently on IMDb, it has 5.6 out of 10 stars, but with every passing episode, I think the IMDb star rating is just a pile of horse shit. Yeah, I think it really is. It just seems to be always in the middle. And it never really seems to reflect good or bad anything. Which makes me wonder what, like, a one-star IMDb movie is. It's gotta be, like, made on a hundred dollar butt. It's like you and I. Our fucking, our goddamn sketch we did six years ago is probably a three-star IMDb. (laughs) I don't know about all that. But, yeah, this movie, uh, it, it, from what I get, it kind of made a bit of a splash in the horror world when it first came out. Um, yeah, and, and neither you or I are big horror buffs. Well, especially no. not you. No, I like me I a few good horror, horror movies, movies, but... I have not watched very many horror movies at all. Uh, the ones I have I refer to a lot because they're the only ones I've seen. Like, full-on, straight-up horror horror, which this really isn't... This is just kind of a gore movie. This one kind of sits between... For those of you who don't know what trauma is... <sighs> God fucking damn it. Trauma is a pile of shit that a bunch of people convince themselves they like. Uh, <laughs> it's just really low budget, poor quality, gore fest. Like, let's celebrate the whole the Ed Wood style. No, we have no money for this, and we're going to make this movie with a shitty plot, and there's titties a lot of times, and it's all it's really outrageous, outlandish, and like, let's just really go so far over the line that we get into a good movie. That's their line to think. They never get there because all their movies are shit. Right. I've yet to see one that wasn't shit. Neither have you. Because we've, is... we've both watched our share of trauma movies. Sergeant Kabuki Man, NYPD. Yeah. Uh, Poultry <laughs> Geist will haunt me forever, and I've now probably seen it six times because everyone in my life is shit. And I'm naming all of them in my suicide note. Uh, so... Yes, um, this is more, Cabin Fever is more, it leans more towards gore than horror. Like, there's really not many traditional horror elements. There's a bit, there's like a, a little sequence that kind of is, but it's not big on the jump scare, which, which that's what gets me. I hate jump scares. I am mm. a terrible coward when it comes to stimuli. Like, I'm not afraid of a lot of things, but, like, when it comes to being jumped at and, like, roller coasters and shit like that, terrible. Piss my pants, coward. So I hate that kind of stuff. Um, And as far as gore goes, I'm kind of in the middle. There's certain things. There's one particular scene I'll talk about in this movie that I couldn't, I still have not watched. I just can't. I can't do it. Uh, But, you know, like, spraying blood and stuff doesn't really affect me. So, and that's kind of what, like, the Rotten Tomatoes... uh, review sort of encompasses like there they they sort of write like a summary review we don't talk about it often but the critic consensus is more gory than scary cabin fever is satisfied with paying homage to genre conventions rather than reinventing them and you had talked about this uh on your last episode when you had assigned me this movie um where you'd kind of said like this draws I, i don't actually i don't remember if it was on the episode or just in our regular lives this one draws a lot on hard tropes and like outlines them 
But the problem is, it's not like you know stuff like that even I would know. It, it's it's sort of like kind of deeper cut horror tropes, I think. Which yeah, therefore, it's... I don't think I caught most of them because I don't know what the fuck I'm. I don't know really anything about this genre. Like, um, I think Patton Oswalt is often referred to as a comedian's comedian. Like, he's not yeah. a super popular comedian, but mm-hmm. if you're a comedian, what he's doing, it just clicks with you. Yeah. And I think that's what Eli Roth is supposed to be for, <coughs> like, horror movie, like, buffs, kind mm-hmm. of. Like, if, if, unless you're really into it, it probably isn't going to do much for you. But if you're, like, in the trenches, it's the best thing since sliced bread. Yeah, like uh, on Wikipedia, the reviewers observed the film's homage to low-budget horror thriller f- films, uh, including Night of the Living Dead, Deliverance, which, well, I'll talk about Deliverance in a second, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Evil Dead, and Blair Witch Project. I have actually seen, I haven't seen the original Chainsaw Massacre, I saw the remake, which sucked. Uh, I saw Deliverance, which I don't think Deliverance is a horror movie, I think Deliverance is one of the best thrillers ever written. Just yeah, it also has a fat guy getting raped in the ass. Uh, oh well, yeah, I've never and I, ha- I haven't. I think I saw Evil Dead. That's that's yeah. That's uh, yeah. I, I, I don't know. So like, I, I don't. This is not really my genre that I know a lot about. So I'm gonna miss a lot of this. But apparently, if if you like horror, this film's not bad. I I think it sucked, but I think everything else I've watched so far has sucked worse. This is the best thing I've seen so far, which is not saying much. Yeah. It still shows you the quality on the show is absolute garbage. Well, but... I knew I was taking a risk just because of how well it was received. But uh, if you listen to last week's episode, episode 12, uh, you'll know I personally have a little history with this because I saw it in theaters and hated yes. it. And it's a long, long story I can't get into again. But <laughs> uh, I was very curious just to see your take, even if it was not the worst movie you've seen. Well, I think you you were kind of safe in knowing that I was definitely not going to like. It would have right, to be yeah. really good. There's only one horror film I like, and I'm, I've talked about it before. I'm going to bring it up at least six times this goddamn review because I'm a hack, and I'm sorry that you have to be stuck <laughs> with me. Um, but yeah, uh, Deliverance, Deliverance, great, great movie, and I encourage all of you to watch it. It's boring as hell, and then a guy gets raped, and then it's all about Burt Reynolds' mustache. Um, but anyway, have you ever seen Deliverance? I have not, but I know enough about it that I know it's good, and I that's should it. See that's it. the whole plot. <laughs> It's Burt really... Reynolds, uh, <laughs> deep southern backwoods rape. Yeah, man, they... well, man rape, right? They rape yeah. a man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah man. Yeah. Man. Scale like yeah. a pig. It's it's very popular yeah. in the oeuvre, but I've actually seen it, and people are terrified of it, and I don't know why. It's it's it a very well written, gripping thriller. Because it never yeah never struck me as a horror movie from my like cultural awareness of it. Yeah, I, I remember seeing like a couple, many, I guess not a couple, many years ago now, with watching a show with my mother when we used to live together. Um, there was like one of those I Love the 80s, 70s shows, whatever. And yeah. uh, they talked about that movie and like all the celebrities they were interviewing were terrified of it. What? It's, it's not what? really a horror. I mean, it's It's, it's a like calling Terminator 2 a horror movie. Like, yeah. it's scary as shit when fucking T-900 or whatever his face is. <laughs> Uh, gets all in his melty business, yeah. but it's not a horror movie. It's an action movie that's scary as shit. Yeah, I don't know. But anyway, not here. Unfortunately, I'm not reviewing Deliverance because I could, God, I could do a lot with that. Great we movie. Should, we Go should watch. do a special episode where we review <coughs> movies we actually like. Uh, yeah, I was thinking for the April Fool's episode, maybe. <laughs> um, everybody forget about that. So... <laughs> Uh, oh god it's so hot in here i'm already not wearing pants and i'm already sweating the shirt's coming off soon so picture that like you should have a a little bottle you can mist yourself with (laughs) i should make a coffee but we usually record on like a weekend and it's 7 p.m on a weekday and i'm (laughs) i'm gonna fuck myself i drink coffee now so (laughs) shit's gonna get weird um Okay, so yeah, IMDb, Ron Tomatoes. All right, so Cabin Fever. It's I'm going into it a little weird. Like I'm not sure going into it before I watched it. I'm not really sure where it's gonna go. So bear with me. This this one's a little out there because like I don't have a lot to say more so than just a review and like bits and pieces because it kind of and I think this is this is why I might not like horror movies beyond just being a punk bitch is they kind of just it. Like you watch the movie and it's over and there's nothing left. You know, there's like nothing, right, yeah. there's no really satisfying stories. Watch a bunch of people die. 
which I just fucking turn on CNN if I want to watch a bunch of people die. It's far more that's depressing. A good point. I get a far more visceral reaction than a much better orgasm. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> so, um, you have seen this movie before. We're going to jump into the review right here. But uh, So, I don't know how much you remember, because I believe you saw it when you were 14, and I think now you're like 43. Yep, I saw this half my life ago. <laughs> almost exactly, because I'm actually about to turn 30. Yeah, so you saw it when you were like 15, 14? Yeah. Okay. So, I don't know how much of it you remember, other than you hated it. There were but, a lot um, of curse words. <laughs> I think there's boobies. I don't know. There, there were boobies. So thank you for okay, that. Good. I did. We did get a. Yeah, uh, yeah. We did get that. Um, have we had tits in the show before? Yeah, you got. You have a double dose of tits now. I haven't gotten full on tits. What was my other one? I don't remember. Uh, it was recent. What was your last movie? <laughs> Love wedding marriage, which definitely. Oh no, yeah, you didn't get tits. Fucking god! If there no, were tits uh, in the, that, I think I'd turn into a movie. Code of Honor, you got Oh, tits. there was a stripper, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I forgot there was a stripper in that movie. That's right. I've Mandy Moore wouldn't <laughs> offer up her sweet, succulent tits. <laughs> <laughs> you are married, and we both respect women. Let's just throw that out there. For fuck's sake. Yeah, I respect their sweet, succulent tits. What's the problem? <laughs> How's your wife recovering them? from a car accident, by the way? <laughs> I respect them as people, too, but, like... <laughs> The tits are kind of... I mean, just like in profile, that's the first thing. Yeah. It sticks out the... <laughs> anyway, go ahead. <laughs> God damn it. Um, yeah, I, there, I, I got a hot tip from my D&D friend uh, <laughs> about a movie that I desperately want to give you, but it's like very sex-based, and even Ooh. though it looks wretched... I, you, you'll enjoy that part of it too much, and I hate it. <laughs> I, I hate it. Uh, uh, is it yeah. is it Beethoven? Or the dog? <laughs> no. I remember that movie being very sexual. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, and you've said this a couple of times, Cabin Fever, there's not that much swearing. I think you were just a little prudish kid. No, I, I watched part of it again. I, okay. I, I, you baffle me. We're both vulgar people. Very but. much so. Well, I, I've told you. I, you've either read on my Facebook or I'm fucking doing a thing, or I've told you about how my father would say the word fuck every, like, four words, right? So swearing to me really is not... This is not that sweary. I, 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 I swear. God damn it. Just kill me now. <laughs> Gotta open my throat and just let my... Like, I'm gonna go through and count the curse words. Oh, good. You'll actually watch it. It's pretty dull. Nah, I don't want to do that. Never All mind. All right. So, God, you got off track. Um, so, yeah, you don't remember a whole lot of it. So, I want to play a game with you. And we'll, we'll play it in a minute here when we get to the actual characters. But I want to see... Excuse me. I want you to give me an order of who you think is going to die in what order. Because, spoiler alert, okay. there's five characters. It's a horror movie. Most and or all of them are going to die. Just, just be aware of that. If you've never watched a horror movie before, that's how they go. Most of the people, I'm oftentimes my all of them die. I think I know who the first one to die is and the last one to die is, but I don't know the middle people. Oh, I bet you, I bet you're wrong about the last one. I bet oh. you're wrong because it's a, it's, oh. it's a bit of a bait and switch. Is there a twist? No. <laughs> oh no. No, there is not. <laughs> okay. So yeah, like I said, this might actually be a shorter review, except for the time I've wasted of yours since the beginning of this. Um. The opening credits crawl, uh, it takes my goddamn lifetime to get through. Uh, <laughs> but as part of it, one of the things I did catch is that we can thank Angelo Battalamenti for three songs in the film. He got special call out in the credits opening crawl oh. for this. Uh, Red Dream, the ever classic love theme, and my Ooh. personal favorite, Deputy Winston's theme. Oh, Deputy Winston. So there's that yeah. at least. Uh, yeah, so as anyone who's listened to the show before knows, I'm I'm big into things making sense and plots tying together, which, like I said, is another reason horror movies don't really speak to me. Uh, and again, I'm a massive coward, so I avoid them. Um, so the fact that I have to watch a horror movie in the first place, just let, let me sing a song to Isaac. Fuck you, Isaac. Fuck you, Isaac. I hate your guts. This song was a lot funnier when I wrote it at two in the morning. Um, you are very welcome. I tip my hat to you, sir. Yeah, okay. Yeah, this movie, my biggest problem with it is that it doesn't know what it is. It's It teeters between being a comedy and a serious, gross-out horror movie without ever really embracing it one way or the other. 
uh, like, compare this to Cabin in the Woods, which, again, I talk about all the time. It's a really fantastic movie. Isaac, if you haven't seen it, watch it. It's it's amazing. I have not. I need to check it out. I've it heard straddles the line of horror and comedy perfectly. Evil Dead, same thing. Like, the Evil Dead movies, like, but with they're also very good about being funny and scary and gory at the same time. Cabin mm. Fever just... It, it it just doesn't do it right. It's it's so jar like it it jumps from one to the other in a very jarring way. And usually neither one is good enough to really merit it being funny, to merit it being funny or scary. Like it doesn't it doesn't mesh well, and it like it's kind of jarring. Um, I, I have a theory that ninety five percent of the plot of this movie exists to put you in the frame of mind for the very last joke, and the last <laughs> joke is a great joke. I I really ten out of ten. It's fantastic. They they got me on it, but then like looking back, I was like, oh, that was that was all for this. Uh, oh, Jesus Christ! That I wasted an hour and a half of my life twice for that joke. <laughs> so um, everything leading up to us to put you off the scent, but we'll get to that. So uh, the movie opens with a shot of a lake, which we never get named. We never really know where they are. They're just in the woods somewhere, backwater hillbilly woods, in up in the mountains. You get a very Deliverance vibe. Actually, reading through that that Wikipedia list, I'm kind of starting to see a bit of the points. Because it's very much, they're isolated up in the woods with like a very insular, yuck, yuck community that, you know. So they Roth might be very consciously echoing Deliverance here. Kind of, yeah. Although I think the the biggest thing, yeah, kind of, kind of. Uh, prob- it's, it probably takes place in the South based on the accents and the temperament of the folks there. Uh, we see a hunter of some kind is carrying a dead rabbit through the woods back home to his dog. We see the dog lying on the ground. He is obviously quite dead, which makes me very sad already. I, I had to go pet my dog for a minute and tell them I loved Aww, him because he's my son Larry. and one of the only things that cares about me. Uh, the hunter is <laughs> hes trying to entice dead Rover with the rabbit, but the dog is so obviously dead. This just looks silly because his belly is all covered in blood and the hunter can't yeah. figure this out. Until he tries to pick the dog up, which opens up like a book, which is fucking disgusting. Oh, And it God. sprays the hunter in the face with blood. So, again, that's the kind of thing we're in for here. So, right, strap yeah. in. Full gore out. Ugh. So, the hunter screams, and the scene cuts to a brunette girl in a truck who is screaming at a kid to not go to college, as it's all a scam and it sucks. And as this is a horror movie, and I can assume anyone within the ages of 18 to 25 will be dead within this movie, I bothered to learn no names and instead will refer to them by their defining characteristics, which will evolve throughout the film as we learn more about these people. So, uh, boy howdy, are we going to learn a lot about these people, especially (laughs) our main protagonist who's going to get his name just a bit later. Um, uh, We have five protagonists here. They're heading out to the cabin in the middle of nowhere for a relaxing getaway, I guess. I, not my idea of a good time. I, I can't think of a group of my five friends I'd want to go out to a cabin with. Fucking or no fucking beer. I don't drink, so there's <laughs> nothing there. I, there's no. I don't do drugs, so I got nothing there either. So for me, this is a pointless endeavor. Um, we have Yelly Brunette, who I'm going to call Peggy the Brunette, which we'll see why later. We have Douchey Blonde Guy, uh, who affectionately I've called Douche because that is his character trait. We have the stereotypical jock asshole that I refer to as Meathead. Stereotypical nice. blonde girl who I'm going to call blonde fr- Blondie Friend Zone for reasons that will become apparent very soon. And Bland Male Protagonist, who we'll uh, have a special I, name for just in a bit. I know enough that I know how all of these characters relate to each other. Yeah, it's very stereotypical. Like, when I saw these characters, you could see very quickly that this is he's going for, like, obvious homages to heart. I mean, even... Even my limited knowledge base can see that, oh, they're the most stereotypical people in the, on the planet. Mm. So let's take a second here. And uh, so we have our five characters. I'll list them again. We got Peggy Brunette, Blondie Friend Zone, Douche, Meathead, and the Bland Protagonist. Would you like to, I'd like to list, I'd like you to list who you think is going to die in order, please. And if you think someone doesn't die, you can also say that. Um, Peggy Friend Zone dies first. Okay. Well, that's two different people. <laughs> really? Peggy Brunette and oh, okay. Blondie Friend Zone. Blond- Blondie Friend Zone. She Blondie dies Friend Zone dies first. Okay, I should be writing this down because I'm a fucking schmuck. All right. Um, that is a very solid guess. Blondes are always known to go first. 
And, oh, because the order they actually die. Because I know people get sick and die in different orders. I'll go... I'll go Meathead dies next. Okay. Then Blonde Douche. Okay. Then the other female. Okay. That's Peggy Burnett. Okay. And then Protagonist Boring Man. Okay, so you're going all five die. Protagonist. Okay. Uh, so you're going all five die. Oh, does Meathead live? Fuck. I don't remember. I'll, I'll stick with my original guess. All, all right. five die. All five die in the order of Blondie Friend Zone. Meathead, douche, Peggy Brunette, and Bland Protagonist. Got it. Now, yeah, I, I, I give them these names, and that's all the background about these characters you need, because that's all their history that really matters, and that's right, yeah. everything about them that's really important is just contained in those little phrases. So, um, and, and it, you might be thinking, well, what the fuck does Peggy Brunette mean? Oh, we'll get there. Uh, so... Okay, what we got here? And blah, 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 blah. Looking at my notes because I fucking lost my place because I was writing down on my phone. So this unlikely band of heroes is piled into the truck for a relaxing weekend of getting drunk. And I would assume fucking each other. Uh, but as we'll see, that's not entirely the case. So there's some light banter in the truck on the way where we get basic details about everyone. Peggy Brunette and Douche are fucking one another. And Meathead is a meathead. Male protagonists make faces that indicate that he's a tortured soul who takes care of any everyone. Typical stuff here. Kind of like I used to do when I was a douchey idiot. Uh, Bland protagonist is also a douche, but there's a better name for him, which we'll get to later. Douche, he's a just, his whole character is douche. So oh, yeah, full that's all on he needs douche. To be. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the gang pulls up to a gas station where a bland protagonist sits on a bench next to a little mulleted blonde kid named Dennis. Uh, <laughs> bland protagonist holds out his hand and says, put her there. And in response, Dennis... Bites him hard on the hand. <laughs> Bland protagonist shrieks and run away. When Dennis's father comes out with a baseball bat, yanking Dennis by the hair. Protagonist says, I'm fine, I'm fine, don't hit him or anything. To which the dad responds, everybody knows not to sit next to Dennis. Mongrel will give you tetanus. Which I thought was pretty funny. Like, th- <laughs> there is some... Th- the humor that works, it's pretty good. Well, Eli mm-hmm. Roth is not a slouch. Like, like I said, this is definitely the best movie we've had on this show. Eli Roth knows what he's doing. It's just not done well. He knows how to do it, and he just kind of fucks it up. He kind of puts so, his, his dick in it. So he hits his mark perfectly in places, but not it, it, consistently. It, yeah, yeah. Like, I, I, the humor that works is great. Because th- this, there's a, there's two other gags in here that I thought were great. Like, I actually laughed at. Like, I laughed at that. Like, everyone knows not to sit next to Dennis. That's fucking great. <laughs> um, so, and, yeah, there's some really, there's a couple of really subtle gags, which we'll get to then later, too. Especially with Dennis. Because Dennis, Dennis delights me. Um, okay, so, uh, Blank Protagonist says, maybe you should make a sign about Dennis. And that the dad's <laughs> urging, he goes to wash his bitten hand in a stream out back. And while he's washing his hand, he's just approached by two random dogs that he just starts to pet. And that's it. We never see that again. Oh, I know the twist. And we... <laughs> I figured it out. Okay, we, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. I'm curious. Is it, do you remember the twist or are you figuring it out via being a smart person? No, I don't remember it. I, it's all Dennis, isn't it? <laughs> that's your theory is that it's all Dennis. He's the source of the cabin fever. Okay, I'll write that down too because I have a lot to say about that. Because there's a lot, there's a lot going on with Dennis. Oh, um, Dennis. <clears throat> so yeah, so he's washing his hand in this stream because they're in the South, and that's they think that's what fucking running water is. Uh, sorry to any of our listeners in the South, but we don't have listeners. No, no, so. no, don't apologize. They're, they're um, not listening. They don't have the internet. Yeah, they don't have ears. Uh, yeah, he he's like he's petting up these dogs, and then they just they they never show up again. There's a lot of scenes that pad out this movie that I don't understand. So I wrote it off as just either they needed a better running time or it's a reference I don't get. But there's like a lot of little scenes that just don't go anywhere. And like, why this, this is to- also Eli Roth's first movie, I believe. So it, either, yeah, he was padding it out or like um, way over the top. I'm going to make an homage to everything. Mm-hmm. but, like, no one's gonna get it. Like, homages are great, but at a certain point, if you cram too many of them in, then no one's gonna get it, and it's just gonna seem random. Y- yeah. So, I, I feel like he might have fallen prey to that. This is just, like, a 45-second scene where he it's just him walking to the stream, he washes his hand in the stream, two dogs come up, and he's like, hey, boys, and pets them, and then it cuts back to inside, and that's that's it. Like, 
it, it was almost a minute of screen time for nothing that it didn't advance any plot. It didn't do anything for anything. Like, this never comes up again. So, and I, I don't mind that sort of thing. Like, I don't get mad every time I see a car in motion with no dialogue, for example. Right, yeah. But when it adds literally nothing to the plot other than running time, well, then what's the point? Yeah, and sometimes you need a cut scene just to establish, like, a, a change of scene sure, or time absolutely. or whatever. I have no problem but that, that last that's... five seconds or less. That's basic filmmaking. If it advances yeah. the scene in any way, any way at all, I'm, or the, the plot, I'm fine with it. That, that's fine. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't mind. But there's a lot of these little scenes that don't. This is, this tells us nothing about his character. This tells us nothing about the plot. Nothing. It advances nothing. So I, it, and this is the first time I notice it, but not the last. But anyway, mm-hmm. um, so the other four are uh, also dogs play a weird part in this movie that never really makes sense to me. Um, Inside of the, the other four are inside of the gas station, and it's like one of those old timey, like never got out of the '60s gas stations where there's like a an old man in suspenders in there. It's like ah, I've been tending gas right, here yeah. since the Reagan era, and I don't know when Reagan was president because 1980s, I, Larry. I okay, then more than Reagan. Ah, oh, God, I used to be really good at history. I did. I, I was born good. during the Reagan administration. Technically, wow. fuck, you're old. Yeah, you a dick. You were born during H.W. <laughs> yeah. I was. <laughs> uh, th- there's meaningless banter about jars of fox piss when eventually Blondie friend zone asks the old man owner what the gun behind the counter for, to which he kind of casually replies, oh, that's for N-words. <laughs> oh. And he says N-words? Yeah, no, he says the word. Oh. I'm not going to oh. say it because I don't want to offend anyone, but he says the word, the N-word. That, yeah, yikes. A- Honestly, that's about the answer I would expect. Again, I do think this movie is based south of the Mason-Dixon line. A, an accurate portrayal of some people who live in that region, I would say. <laughs> the This scene with the gun and the N-word is incredibly important to the plot. <laughs> and I am not kidding <laughs> in the slightest. Please Jeez. remember the scene. I'm not, I swear to whatever god you believe in that I, I have a theory. I need you to remember this. Oh, god. Okay. So... After the old man utters his racial slur, the kids take their leave. They get stopped by Dennis's father, who rightly accuses Meathead of stealing a Snickers bar, which he admits to and returns. Another scene of just padding out time here. It, it yeah. doesn't go anywhere, and every one of these characters is an awful piece of shit. We already got that from from like what we've seen so far. We don't really need more scenes to establish that. Like it's done. So this is just more like padding out plot because it never comes up again. And, and he's. Meathead in the car earlier has already proven to be a piece of shit. Like, this doesn't add anything. Just just stop it. Stop it, Eli. <laughs> so, again, more stuff happening on the way to the cabin, not worth mentioning, except that uh, Meathead wants to go back to the store as he left his mom's apple juice there. What? I, I don't know. It's just like, a, while they're showing the, the, the car go through mud, and just say, we gotta go back. I left my mom's apple juice in there. My mom? Who has a, whose mom has apple juice? He tells a story later about a dog licking his asshole, so I don't know what's up with him, man. He's what? Just... Yeah, we'll get to that. Okay. Uh, so they arrive at the cabin where uh, Douche and Peggy Brunette immediately start fucking. Like, they get into the room and they start stripping and fucking. Right. Okay. Uh, Brun- Brunette decides to hang tit, which is the lady equivalent of hanging dong, which ah. is a, a, a term I invented while writing this review. And I'm now <laughs> going to reap the rewards of hanging tit for the rest of my life because it's brilliant. And I briefly <laughs> didn't hate myself, so let me have this. Um, it's pretty good. You, so yeah, I'm one on or both? What's, uh, both. She hangs both. Oh, she hangs nice. tits. But hang nice. tit is funnier. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So uh, Bland protagonist and Blondie friend zone are taking a walk with Meathead, who go, or, uh, he splits off from them with a large BB gun to shoot squirrels because he says, and I quote, squirrels are gay. Adorable. Wow, uh, this uh, movie was 2002, I believe, right? That sounds yeah. sounds yeah. about right, based on being in middle school that era. Yep. So now we get into the good shit, and by good shit, I mean terrible, awful shit. Blind protagonist <laughs> and Blondie friend zone are walking through the woods. Uh, BFZ, as I'll refer to her when I get tired of saying Blondie friend zone. She's taking pictures, and he says, So Karen, because apparently her name is Karen, I forgot I wrote this quote down. I've been thinking, which it's just never good. Ladies, if someone ever says to you that they're they're th- so blank, I've been thinking, they're trying to fuck you. 
Maybe they want to date you on top of it. But if they're saying the words, so name, I've been thinking, what they have been thinking about is fucking you in your pussy hole. I, I would say if a guy says anything to you, that's what he's thinking about. I assure you, take it from a guy who cannot talk to women and used to be astonishingly even less of a Casanova than I am now. Because I am not. It's a shitty, stupid cop-out phrase. And as soon as he said that, I got the entire breadth of their relationship. Because it's just it friend zone. That's And I don't use that term derogatorily. I know that's becoming more in the crosshairs of, of various groups. And I, I get it. That I'm just using it yeah. because it's the easiest well, way to describe what's happening Right, here. yeah. He, the, uh, the, the whole incel community victimizing their own bullshit and making friends yeah, on a whole thing. Yeah, but, yeah. But Fucking I don't know. Yeah, incels it, are scummy. Yeah, like, the and I, I didn't, because I, I don't know. Like, I went down a bit of a path of, like, for a couple of years where I was trending towards some neckbeardy incel shit. Mm. And yeah, then I, you know, d- dug myself out of that pretty quick because I had, you know, reached the age of reason. Yeah, um, yeah, that's but, an important age to hit. And and I didn't realize this fact until I was already in a committed relationship, which has since blossomed into a marriage. But like, it, don't chase people. Like, just be very. If you're interested in someone, be very upfront. Hey, are you interested in going out or spending more time together? And then yes or no. If it's a no, game over, done, move on. There's okay. plenty of time, plenty of other people in the world. Yeah, you just can be sad about get, it, but don't just yeah. live your life. Exactly. Just get that out of the way quickly and progress. And I know, I know, we like to joke about you and your wife and all that in relationship. But you, you're like your story with your wife is quite romantic. Like when you really like put it down to paper, it's really like very like romance movie worthy, like a good one. Yeah. Well, it wouldn't translate into a, a movie per se, yeah, but I, but yeah, I, it I'm was using that because we're on a movie podcast. Like it's right, very, yeah. it, it's very like genuine and sweet and I, I i like the story of it a lot i saved her drowning on a beach and then i fucked her on the same beach right then yeah. that is <laughs> <laughs> wow isaac Jesus. my wife is my wife is a dolphin <laughs> <laughs> that explains her name's all the flipper clicking. her name's flipper four <laughs> Not not based on the movie Flipper 4, because she was the fourth Flipper, because the first three died. It's like the different lassies. <laughs> oh, God. Um, so, yeah, but that... To, get, to come back into Cabin Fever, that the, the entire breadth of their relationship is... There, he's totally head over heels into her, and... We never are quite sure whether or not she is into him or not. At least I wasn't. But then again, I'm terrible at that. And that's why I'm going to die alone. But it's, it doesn't <laughs> seem like it. Like, she, they're just friends. But I think that she's supposed to like him. Kind of. It's 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 never really clear to me. But she's I, playing I think hard they, to get. Gross. Yeah, but they, they do this whole thing where, where they're always like, will they, won't they? And they never yeah. do. <laughs> so... Ugh. Uh, but yeah, that line, like, uh, so Karen, I've been thinking. He is thinking about fucking you. Ladies, if someone says that to you, stop him and say, uh, are you trying to fuck and or date me? Because I assure you, it's definitely fuck you. It's it probably date you as well. Yeah, it's if you get the end or... That, that someone is a coward. If you get the end or, then maybe say, all right, well, let's go. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, that that instantly made me dislike this guy... Because it reminded me, A, of my 14-year-old self, and B, <laughs> of, of just a really, like, shitty way to be. So don't do that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they've got the whole friend zone. As in, like, he's always been... She's never looked at him romantically, which is why I use friend zone. Not to... I, I'm not saying... I'm not trying to start a political the, incident. I'm using it to... Just, the culpability of him being in the friend zone is not on her. Exactly. It's on him. Exactly. Yes. Fuck I, everything! I swear to God, it's so hard to say anything anymore. <laughs> not, not, I'm not complaining. I'm just, I'm trying to not step on any because I'll, I'll say anything. I don't care. I'm impossible to offend. I, I fucking call me whatever you want. I don't. Words don't mean anything to me. I don't want to hurt anyone else's feelings. That's all. See, the problem with LGBT is next people are going to be marrying badgers. That's what's <laughs> going to happen next, Larry. Well, I, I hate badgers, which is unrelated <laughs> to. 
I just fuck badgers. Don't marry badgers. Yeah, no, I'm I'm yeah. on that guy's side. Yeah, I fuck badgers. I just wouldn't want to marry them. That's not right by the Bible. <laughs> just... You can fuck them. <laughs> Can't marry them. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I think that's uh, Austin three seventeen is actually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thou shalt fuck badger, but not marry. That part usually gets drowned out by the beer smashing over his head. Yeah, yeah. They they turn the microphones down for that one when that chant starts. <laughs> but he um, says it every time if you read his lips. I know. Stone Cold Steve Austin talks a lot about badger fucking. And now we've just started a feud. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good. We should have a first podcast feud. Yeah, I can't wait. Come at us, Stone Cold. We're ready. Oh, he has a really popular podcast. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he has, a legal, he has a legal team, too. Yeah. Allegedly. Badger fucker. <laughs> yeah, Steve Austin, alleged badger fucker. Oh, wow. he was in one of our movies. God damn it. He was in Smosh... The- Fuck, I hate this he podcast. He was in Smosh the Movie. I hate everything about life. I forgot, he was the best part of Smosh the Movie, too, wasn't he? Well, no, but it was a disappointment because he wasn't in the bear costume. Oh, that's the right. Elbow drop. That's right. He, he was the biggest it. letdown of the movie. <laughs> but also the best part of the movie, so it's kind of weird. Oh, man. Such a love-hate relationship. <laughs> All right, so, oh, God. Bland protagonist and Blondie friend zone are walking through the woods. We see sh- shots of meathead drinking and shooting and pissing in the woods. While we also, it cuts between that and Douche and Peggy Brunette vigorously fucking one another. Um, and this is where she earns her name. Because eventually, she says, I want to fuck you. And starts fucking him in the ass. <laughs> oh. To his Peggy. great enjoyment. He, he thoroughly enjoys it. Which, you know what? Oh. I am all for. Hence the name yeah. Peggy Brunette, because she pegs him. All and, right. And like I said, no knocks on it here, because I'm into... I'll do anything once. I don't give a fuck. Yeah, as so long as it's fully you consensual. Lo- like what away. you like. Yeah, as long as it's consensual. Like what you like, and if you like getting pegged by your lady friend, more power to you. Or your man friend. Yeah, or your badger friend, if you're Stone Cold Steve Austin. I gotta take a stand. I'm gonna be the Rush Limbaugh of Badger fucking. I don't like it, and I want it out of my country. <laughs> so, Blanche protagonist and Blondie friend zone are on a raft on the lake, and they're talking about kissing. She tells a story about how a different male friend of a long time tried to kiss her, and how she found it gross. Hey, that's just like their relationship. Ba 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 na ba. Um. There's more of this awkward back and forth, like we just talked about, blah, blah, blah. Eventually, we get to the two of them kissing, because as she says, uh, blonde friend zone, that is, she wants to know if he's a good kisser. They get into it a little before she awkwardly just rolls off the raft, and he gets up and knocks his boner aside and says, what happened? I thought we were kissing. And she says, well, we were now, and now we're not. He says, well, what, do you like me now? Is this a date? To which she responds, don't be gay. (laughs) I... I can't fault her logic, but her terminology <laughs> bothers me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hence, she here earns her name, Bonnie Friend Zone. Yeah. And I did the Friends of the Okay, so um, their characters, her character's entire story, like the only thing that she's here for, it just revolves around her relationship slash not relationship with Bonnie Protagonist. So, yeah, that's, that's that. Um, okay, so the, the woman's role is just to serve the man. Yes. Uh, okay, great. Let's I'll get need that to take drop. a note and tell my wife. <laughs> uh, let's let's get our, our editing bitch in New Jersey to cut that out for a drop, please. Uh, oh, I'm going to have the worst funeral. I For you. <laughs> I'm going to have a blast. I'm going to wear one of those cummerbunds that flaps up comically in a, a, water, a flower that spits water. I'm going to just play episodes of this podcast on repeat. It's going to be the best. <laughs> um, so back at the habit, uh, the, the cabin, cabin, <clears throat> Meathead makes a big ring of fire for no apparent reason other than for one line in about an hour. Uh, he takes his shot uh, with his gun at what he thinks is a woodchuck. And he has a BB gun, which varies in its mm-hmm. strength and power throughout this movie, which we'll get to. Yeah. That he takes, sounds he takes a right. shot at what he thinks is a woodchuck, but is in fact the hunter from the beginning of the movie with the dog that he opened like a book. Right. Um, he's clearly very sick, and he begs Meathead for help. Uh, Meathead agrees to drive him to the hospital, but the hunter insists on approaching Meathead begging for water and shelter. 
Meathead freaks out and threatens to shoot him, eventually scaring him off by a shot to the ground near his feet where the hunter falls into a ditch and Meathead just kind of leaves. The hunter is like, he's like a hundred yards from the cabin. So Meathead just kind of like lets him fall into a ditch and walks off and that just doesn't do anything about it. Like right. when he gets back to the cabin, he's just kind of grumpy. He doesn't even tell anyone about it. And it, like he, he clearly, the hunter's not dead. I mean, he's very sick, but like it's not like he shot him in the head. He shot him near the ground near his feet like Yosemite Sam and just leaves him. <laughs> and it's like, because it's to the point where the, the hunters look at the cabin and says, hey, is that your cabin? And he just kind of like doesn't mention it to anybody. Meathead is a meathead. But um, yeah. later that night, they're sitting around the fire telling ghost stories to all the protagonists. Uh, Bland Protagonist is a long, drawn-out story that has nothing interesting to share. It's about a 4 out of 10 funny story that uh, murders at a bowling alley. Um, it's another padding for time. It doesn't go anywhere. But it's to get shots of there, this guy throwing severed heads and arms down at bowling pins as he's bowling with them. That's the whole oh, okay. reason for it. It's padding, yeah. but there, there's it's for people who like gory stuff. Um, right, yeah. Moving on, there's more stuff here that th- this is just straight padding. It doesn't... I don't fucking get. A stoner dude and his dog show up randomly. The dog's name is Dr. Mambo, because as stoner guy puts it, he's a professor, dot, 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 at being a dog. And then he says, oh, face, and runs his hand down his face, which was... What? For for five minutes in the early 2000s, face was an insult, which I learned from did, did- Always Sunny in Philadelphia, which I had to then look up the origins of. Where it's like, did that involve running your hand down your face? I don't know the. I don't know that much. I, I just know it was a very like there was a small window of time where saying "faced" was an insult. I recall that, but not the gesture. Yeah, he That's like strange. he like runs his hand down his face. Like you know, have you seen Face Off or seen people make fun of Face Off? Yeah, <laughs> it's like that where he does like the I want to take his face off, and there's a hand motion. It's oh. it's like half of that. So he says that, and no one laughs because, yeah, no one, I, I don't know. Um, so this guy, they, they're te- they tell him to fuck off, but he has a bunch of weed, so everyone's like, oh, hey, come get high and hang out, because that's what people do. <clears throat> so this guy, they set him up, like, thematically, as if he's some kind of villain. I, I don't know. Everyone in this movie is so over the top. Like, the main characters are over the top, but the the... Uh, I want to call them NPCs because I think of video games. <laughs> the ancillary characters are really all very much over the top, which it's a horror movie, so I, I'm not going to complain. It's fine. But it makes it hard. I, I don't... I feel like they set up a lot of stuff that doesn't get delivered on. And they really make this guy... Like, this guy, his name, he calls himself... His skating name, and I use air quotes here, is Grim. Because <laughs> I... What? I don't know. They set him up like a villain. He seems like really like mysterious and villainy, but it's just a red herring as we'll see, and it's a really shitty red herring. But anyway, he is um, he immediately starts hitting on Blondie friend zone, to which she is totally into it because you know I guess the guy's got weed and he's horribly gross looking to me. But then again, I, I'm a straight man, so I have trouble telling men unless they're ridiculously handsome. Uh, so, yeah, and then, like, me, uh, so, uh, Bland Protagonist, he's like, all, oh, she just doesn't like me. She's gonna fuck Grim. And Meathead is, like, poking fun at him because he's never sealed the deal with all these years because he's been chasing her since he's been eight. So, yeah, okay, great. We got, yep, I, I got it. That's how relationships work. I, I didn't, I didn't need the reminder, but then again, I was an incel for when I was 14 because I didn't know, and I hate that term, but unfortunately it describes what I was when I was a kid because I didn't know any better and i just fucking anyway um so yeah it starts to rain uh, and grim fucks off into the night to his tent and he's gonna come back with bring more weed he has a bunch of shit sitting out in the rain so he leaves um the group goes inside and they're all talking about jerking off as you do um blondie friend zone talks about using their shower head to masturbate and meathead talks about uh when he was jerking off, the dog was licking his balls and then stuck his tongue up his ass as he came. Oh. Because that's just peachy. Um, anyway, <laughs> I don't know why we needed to hear that. Uh, the hunter shows back up, knocking on the door, asking for help. They offer to help him, but he recognizes Meathead and, and calls him out for leaving him in a ditch. Uh, Meathead slams the door on him. The hunter tries to take the car, so everyone arms themselves and runs out after him. 
Uh, he spits up a bunch of blood inside the car as they're trying to, like, scare him off. And he manages to dodge all three of the boys, like, swinging at and shoot him at him. He dodges mm. all of them, even though he's, like, clearly dying of an illness and, like, spewing <laughs> blood everywhere. And these three guys are in shape. Like, they're not... Meathead is, like, a football player. He's he's not a slouch. Uh, so he dodges all the boys, and he's coming at the girls, and he's, like, begging for help this whole time. Uh, and the girls spray him with hairspray or some shit, and then Bland, Pro- Bland Protagonist... Yeah, they just try and get him away. Like, they try to spray him in the eyes. Um, Bland Protagonist hits him with a log from the fire, which sets the hairspray or whatever, or a cleaner... It's probably, like, lights oh, or something. God. It sets him on fire... So he runs off screaming into the night just to pillar of flames, standard stuff. Um, so they've murdered a man. Yes. Inside, everyone is arguing about what to do. They, they, they never... Okay, I, I blew past that. Yes, they've clearly murdered him, but whether or not they think they killed him is the plot of the next 35 minutes of this movie. Ugh. <clears throat> and Ugh. it's gonna... It leads... Like, that thought of, did we kill this guy? Leads to one character's death. Like someone dies because he's, they're not sure if this hunter is dead. <laughs> and it's in the oh, dumbest way possible, as we'll see. <laughs> um, I really don't remember where any of this goes. Well, that, that was a bit of a deep cut, but you'll, it's the dumbest part of this whole movie. Um, inside, everyone's arguing what to do. The car, they've thoroughly fucked it. They've beaten it to death and shot it to death accidentally. Because three athletic young men in perfect health couldn't do anything to stop a fucking sick fifty, a sick fifty year old. Um, they go to bed for the night as they can't do much else. And the next morning, they find the car is completely covered in sick hunter blood, uh, which you know tends to carry diseases. Douche and Meathead leave to go try and find a mechanic, while Peggy Burnett goes off in another direction to find a different mechanic. Quote a question mark. I don't know. Yeah. She just. They leave to go find help, and she leaves to go find help. Okay, um, we see that the hunter has indeed, we being the audience, hunter has indeed died in the reservoir, and his blood and sickness have infected the water. Now, the cinematography in this film is not, uh, wow, that came out wrong. The cinematography in this film is not bad. Um, There's a lot of really good shots and, like, musical cues about the water. Because the water... Now the water is infected. And that becomes the plot. of That becomes the... the, the uh, Like, driving force of this film. So, there's a lot of good shots of, like, the water. Them, like, sh- the camera having it just in frame. Like, they'll pour somebody a glass. And there'll be tension of, you know, they haven't drank it yet. But we know it's bad. And, like, the musical kind of... Right. You'll see someone reach for it. It's pretty well done. I'll give credit here. Not the best. It's been done better. Um, if you've ever seen... Uh, what's the Tarantino movie? The Hateful Eight. The, like, there's a poison scene in that. And it's the same thing. Mm-hmm. But the tension's much better. Because it's just done better. And Tarantino's a fucking master. That's what comes into my head when I think about this. But I, okay. I did like how they do it here. Because you know now we know the water's bad. They don't. You could have done it very ham-fistedly. And I think it's done pretty yeah. well. That's um, a really nice way to subtly sort of break the fourth wall, too. Yes. Where you're nodding to the audience. You have this knowledge that the characters don't have. Because... Like, just uh, in theory, I like that as a writing technique. Yeah, no, it's 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 well done. And, and like, the music, the way it kind of evens out when somebody does drink it, because obviously someone, people are going to fucking drink it. Uh, it's, it's, it's well done. Like, because it's that sort of, you get to build anticipation of, ah, shit, well, how is this going to affect them now? Like, are they going to live? Are they for sure dead? What's going to happen to him? So, kudos. It, it, like like I said, this is a 63% film. Technically a failing grade, but it's above <laughs> 50. So, it, it's not... Th- there's a lot of good in it. it it's mm-hmm. just kind of in a... It's like a good engine in a really shitty car. It's like you're putting a brand new engine into like uh, a fucking... I don't know anything An about An 09 cars. Hyundai Accent? <laughs> oh, why do you say that, Isaac? Do you have a story about an 09 Hyundai Accent? No, my 09 Hyundai accent that I've had for nine years didn't just die on me and cost more than the Kelly Blue Book value to replace, even though there were only 130,000 miles on the fucking car. Anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, it's good to know you come from a place of complete neutrality when you say that. <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> yeah, it's allegedly a terrible car. Um, 
Okay, yeah. There's not a ton of these water scenes where, like, you really get that sort of tension. I, they could have done more with it, and they could have done a lot more, like, fake-outs of, like, you know, if some... And this is conjecture. This is me writing a better movie, as I often do. Um, like, <laughs> if Meathead was about to... Dr- if Meathead, you know, in the end of the movie, let's say he ultimately gets shot by Jesus. I don't know. Gandhi. Uh, but, like... He almost drinks the water, and like you could, you could do that a lot better. Mm-hmm. I feel like you had a great setup here. Again, good engine. The wires leading to the engine don't quite make it. It's almost there, but it's it's a good attempt, and I appreciate that in a show where I have to watch fucking Mandy Moore lead me through what I didn't realize is going to be the worst hour of forty minutes I've had in the last ten years. But um, <laughs> so anyway. Uh, BFZ and the bland protagonist are kind of bemoaning what they did and about how they pretty much killed that guy. And um, they're kind of, she wants to go home and he's like saying like, I can't believe this happened. And we actually see her drink a glass of water. Like I said, all the things I just said in the last couple minutes. So we know that she's probably on her way out, which is again, okay. So now we know she's blonde friend zone has a time bomb in her because she drank the tainted water out of the reservoir. Because they'd show like a shot of the, like, when they show the hunter, like, bleeding into the water, um, they show the pipe. They follow the pipe all the way up to the cabin. Right. But, again, another okay. good shot. Um, so we get some long, long, long scenes here with the others out looking for help. That again, they don't add anything or go anywhere. Um, and it's like, it's like 15, 20 minutes of just nothing yeah. really mattering. Uh, there's, filler. There's plot. It's not straight filler, but it's not plot that matters. Like... They come up, it, Meathead and Douche come up to um, a lady who's, like, slaughtering a pig. But it's, uh, first of all, for a movie that's gory as fuck, they show the slaughtering off screen. Uh, they, yeah, why wouldn't you take advantage of that? And, like, well, they show the pig with its guts out, and, like, it's all rotted on the inside. Mm-hmm. Which, I, I, I don't want to go into all the details of the scene because it doesn't matter. But the long, like, the, the rotten pig is important, and we'll get to that. Um... But yeah, so the, she's like bitching how these animals are rotted and, you know, like something's wrong with the place and something's going on. And then like through dialogue and them talking to her, they, they realize they're, they're going to try to get help and uh, get a mechanic. But the only mechanic in town is her cousin who was the hunter that they've killed. So that's it. And they run off like they make an excuse and leave. And that never comes up again. She's out of the movie and the hunter, for the most part, his contribution is done. Except right. for like them talking about him. So this really kind of doesn't go anywhere. And the thing with the slaughtered pig, as I'll get into in a bit, it, it, it's more kind of muddies the narrative than anything. Same thing with with uh, Peggy Brunette. She is at a she goes off to and like finds a house that's empty and runs into Douche at Meathead, who they've left their scene and come to this one, and they just kind of talk and that's it. It doesn't nothing. They they can't get help. That's the what happens at the end of this. Mm-hmm. Um, so while all that's happening, Bland protagonist gets a visit from Deputy Winston. <sighs> Let's talk about Deputy Winston. Again, another character who I, I don't understand. He's set up like a villain, kind of. He, he, does, he has, he's really over the top. Like his whole thing is like, yeah, I'm a cool cop. Like you're the party man. Like you got a party and you got to fuck this blonde girl and you have a good time. And don't worry about this hunter. Like we're not going to let him ruin your good party time. And it's really muddy. Like what? It's not like suspenseful. There's mm-hmm. you can you can have mystery. Like I don't need to have everything explained to me. I know the way I talk and review things, I make it sound like I need to have everything explained to me at all the times to be happy. I don't. But there's good and bad. And he, it just like it, it's it's not a mysterious sort of thing. Like what's Deputy Winston up to? It's like a well, what the fuck was that about? Because it doesn't right. really give you anything to latch on to that you're like, ooh, this guy's interesting. No, it's kind of like, well, who's this fucking weirdo? Is he a cop or not? I don't I don't care. Because he's just like, again, he's sort of set up in like a, a villainy kind of way. But Bland Protagonist tells him the entire story. He, he's, he spills all of it. And Winston is like, don't worry about it, man. I'm not, I don't care. That, uh, this, this is a party town. You're the party man. You keep partying. He keeps going into that. <laughs> He calls Bland Protagonist the party man the entire time. That's so bizarre. But the most important part of this whole scene is the excellent, super smooth 
xylophony Deputy Winston theme courtesy of Angelo Badalamenti. Oh, nice. And he was right to get called out for it because it is 85% xylophone and it is smoother than a freshly shaved baby. <laughs> Never heard of xylophone described that way, yeah, it's, but all right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's awesome. I love the Deputy Winston theme. So yeah, he, is that your ringtone now? Not not yet. I've still got the Leo the Lion elephant uh, oh, okay. elephant song as my ringtone. <laughs> Big and white and cruel and mean creatures fear me. I'm the king, Maximus. I I had people over on Fourth of July, and like I subjected like five five of my good friends and family members to about ten minutes of that movie <laughs> uh, of the different. Lion? Yeah, uh, like just the beginning part where the mom's bouncing around off of things, and then the the fucking Nazi song, uh, and then the vegetarian song at the end, and the, the really fucking Nazi, Rainbow Road. Isn't it? It's weird, man. And it's the weird. fucking Rainbow. It, none of it. That movie makes no sense. It doesn't. Even as a kid's movie, it doesn't make sense. Nope. I'm so delighted that you're sharing that with friends and family. Yep, they were horrified. Very horrified. Yeah. Thanks again for making me watch that. You fucking twat. Yeah. <laughs> Eat an ass. Oh, happily. Um, so, yeah, Deputy Winston, it's a, sort of like, a, again, like, what the fuck? What am I supposed to get out of this? I, I don't know. Um, so he tells uh, Blaine Protagonist, he'll send a tow truck, and then he fucks off. Um, so later on, everybody gets back. Meathead and Blaine Protagonist are cleaning out the car of the blood when Grimm's dog, excuse me, uh, Dr. Mambo, shows up <laughs> randomly to just viciously bark. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting very burpy. To viciously bark at them, um, and, like, look threatening. Uh, and Peggy Burnett fires a shot from the BB gun. I, I need to remind you again, they have one gun and it's a BB gun. Uh, she fires that off into the air. It- it's loud, it's a loud gun. Um, they all talk about what's going on, and Douche becomes... He he didn't really start to show this till now, which... he's D- Douche is just kind of there to fuck Peggy, but he starts to become incredibly paranoid about getting sick. Like, out of nowhere. Like, he wants to leave now, but they can't because the car isn't fixed. So, even though they had 20 minutes of trying to find a mechanic, Meathead's just like, all right, I'll fix it. Um, So, uh, and while this is going on, while this scene is happening, we see Peggy Brunette has also now had a glass of water. So, both of our ladies have now drank the sick poison water. So, bad stuff's going to start happening for them, assumedly. Uh, Meathead's fixing the truck while Douche is guarding him with the BB gun because Dr. Mambo is, like, now just a full-time threat to them. Like, he is just constantly, like, barking around the cabin and around everything, which makes no sense, as we'll get to later. Because no sign of Grimm, just Dr. Mambo, the dog. Um. Oh, here we go. Here's the part I've been not wanting, that, that really soured me on this fucking movie. <laughs> So BFZ, uh, Blondie Friend Zone, she leaves the gathering as she feels nauseous. Because, remember, she's now got the water sickness. Um, They don't know that yet. So Bland Protagonist leaves to go check on her. And at her request, cuddles with her in bed as she doesn't feel well. Because she's drinking more water. And again, every time she drinks water, we get like a little bit of a musical cue. Like a sick sounding musical cue, which I like. Good good stuff. Yeah. Um, Yeah, nice, subtle. Yeah. They cuddle and eventually BFZ falls asleep. And Bland Protagonist decides to rape her. Um. Yep. Uh, what? He just starts stroking her face a bunch of times and just puts his hand down her fucking vagina. It puts his what? Where? He puts his hand down her panties and starts to fucking rape her. Oh. So well, yeah. While she's asleep. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the, the worst kind of fucking so the person. Bill Cosby. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty bad. If you're listening to this podcast and you're sexually developing, that is rape. Children. Yes. He committed lesson, a rape. Lesson one, have sex with awake people. Yeah, if you're having sex with a, a, an asleep person, not consent. Yeah. And the worst part is there's fucking weird romantic music playing over it. Oh, I assume gross. it's the aforementioned love theme, which Ew. is even more disgusting given the context. So, is yeah. it all xylophone? No. It's oh, not well, smooth. It's, it's, it's very it's romantic. xylophone, I bet you'd like the whole scene a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> Stop this! This is bad! <laughs> so, from now on, we're gonna call Bland Protagonist what he is. He's developed into his name, which is Rapist. Okay. He's a fucking rapist. So, yeah. you don't do that. You don't I don't need to go, I don't need to go into an explanation. Person. Yeah, no. That's rule number I, one. 
Cut and dry. Don't need an explanation. He's a fucking rapist and he's the worst. Don't touch other people without their consent for any reason. The movie at least kind of acknowledges a little bit how awful this is. As from this scene on, rapist is just a pure awful piece of shit. Like, he goes, he 180s from being the whiny hanger-on to just human filth. So we're not supposed to like him anymore. So I'll give okay. credit to the movie there. And again, th- this is a movie about a rapist, so I'm not coming down on Eli Roth. I'm coming down purely on the character. That's okay. that's fine. I, you can write stories about that. It's fucking mm-hmm. awful, and I don't. I, I, I ref, it cannot. If it's celebrated, you're fucking human scum. And it's not right. here. I don't like that love theme was playing over it. I think that was in poor taste. Yeah. Um. And yeah, he is at no point again is fucking rapist given any kind of positive limelight. So this is just on the character. Not Eli Roth, you're you're okay. You're out of the crosshairs for this. Um, I don't like you wrote a story about a rapist, but hey, you know that tweets her own. So um, as rapist is draping blonde friend zone, he finds that her vagina is full of blood. Uh, he runs to clean off his hands so no one knows what he's been up to, and they never find out, which is just wonderful. Uh. Um, Meathead freaks out when he finds out that she's got the sickness, uh, locking her in her room. The guys and Peggy Brunette all check one another for sickness spots, making sure none of them have it. And they take Blondie Friend Zone out to a shed where they lock her inside as a makeshift quarantine until they can figure out what to do. To her obvious displeasure. I can't say I argue with them. It's nice to say I wouldn't do that to someone I liked and cared about if they were sick. But in the situation, who knows what I'd do. You know, it's it's tough to right, say. Like, yeah. At a certain point, the survival instinct takes over. Right. And, it, you know, it's really nice to think noble. And, like, you know, if I had children, I would do whatever I could for to save my children. I, I would love to say, because especially I, I get really touchy about that kind of stuff. I don't mean touchy as in, like, I get offended. I touchy as in, like, I, I, I strive to throw myself onto as many blades as possible so other people don't have to even see them. But, again, like you said, survival instinct. So yeah. I, I can't fault them. And she's obviously quite pissed off about it. Um, I, I, I mean, you, I'd roll off the nearest fucking cliff as soon as you sniffled because you, you, fuck you. But that's right, how I course. show you love and you know it. Yeah. Um, more meaningless scenes here that don't go anywhere. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Rapist goes out looking for help and he comes up to a house where a woman is getting naked for either sex or sleep. I'm not sure which. He ogles her through a window like the scumbag that he is before her husband, like, smacks him on the shoulder and chases him off. Nothing here except just to show how scummy he is because we didn't need the fucking reminder, though. Um, yeah. He could have got help but instead decided to ogle a naked woman and she's... Just laying down in a way we don't get to see any nudity, so I get deprived of that. I get to watch a rapist. Oh, poor yeah. beard. Just shut the fuck up. <laughs> um, at the cabin, Douche has lost his fucking mind. He's now completely 100% paranoid about getting sick. Um, he and Meathead fight, and afterwards, Meathead has a glass of water. So he too, dead man walking. No. Um, so Dr. Mambo almost gets into the shed, so they shoot near him instead of just shooting the fucking dog which at this point yeah shoot the fucking dog because he's trying to get at uh blondie friend zone in the shed at um, a certain point if you gotta take out the dog shoot the fucking dog i love yeah. uh, don't i'm sorry if my dog can hear me not your dog not if your dog's you. trying to eat a human person you should kill your dog how much do i like the person <laughs> do uh... i know the person <laughs> I can't. I'm thinking of all these names I'd like to name because I'm curious if you'd kill your dog for their lives. Don't don't bring but they might people listen this. to this, so I'm yeah. not going to. Please don't. But I know I know there's some people that you would choose your dog over. Isaac, my dog is basically my son. Do you remember? And hopefully this is cagey enough. If not, I'll cut it out. Do you remember the gentleman who gave someone a helicopter at yes. the sandwich shop? Yes. Yes. Would you kill your dog for that man? I'm gonna l- let me make it general. Okay. The list of people who I would kill my dog instead of let the dog eat the person. It's a short list. Okay. That's all I need. It's a to short know. list. <laughs> it's a short fucking list. <laughs> you vary. Your your place in that list is a tentative. Depends on what movie I've given you. Yeah. Tow the fucking line early. <laughs> Um, so yeah, anyway, uh, and it's not their dog, it's just some fucking dickhead with weeds dog, and he right, gave yeah. him the face, I'd shoot him for making that shitty face bun. Um, 
so next morning, Meathead is starting to show sick symptom, sickness symptoms, um, but he hides it from the others because Douche has completely fucking lost it now about germs and sickness. But, kind of uh, understandable. Peg- Peggy's not showing symptoms? No, she's not. Not yet. Okay. All right. But I had the same thought that he, he started to show this disease symptoms before she did. Um, so, yeah, Douche lost his mind. Kind of understandable again, but he's being a real fucking douche about it, which right. yeah, name... Makes sense. C name here. So they load uh, BFZ into the car, but she spits up a bunch of blood. Uh, Meathead is like, he's still trying to get people in the car because he knows he's sick, so he's now in a hurry. Um, but so they, no one wants to get in. They're trying to get her back into the... Uh, douche won't go anywhere. And Peggy and Rapist are trying to get BFZ like onto the ground. And he says, well, fuck this. I'm going to get a doctor. And he speeds off. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, like I said, Peggy and Rapist are trying to get uh, BFZ back into the shed douche takes the rest of the beer and just literally fucks off into the woods telling them he's leaving them to die and he will live because he's a survivor and they are idiots Uh, as survivors do walk off into the woods with beer hence the name douche (laughs) (laughs) so peggy burnett and rapist are alone in the cabin and after some banter about them dying uh she says she wants to literally go out with a bang and she and rapist fuck Ah, let's recall that the woman rapist supposedly loved for the last 10 years is literally dying in a shed outside. Right. Yeah. And we see, we see post, yeah, rapist is, uh, fuck him. We see post coitus that rapist has left sex handprints on Peggy's brunette's back that are not going away. Um, back at the gas station, uh, the, from before with the old man and Dennis, which here we go. Let's, let's get to Dennis. Meathead asks Dennis's dad for help, if you remember Dennis's dad, I assume. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and in one of the best jokes of the entire movie, there is now a cardboard sign next to the bench that says, do not, <laughs> do not <laughs> underline, sit next to Dennis. <laughs> Which, just, it's just it's just a sight gag, and it's great. I laughed out loud. Fantastic. Yeah. L- Larry, th- this makes me so much happier, and I, I won't reveal why it makes me happier. <sighs> yeah. Okay, I, love... I don't fucking care. You've seen my Facebook feed. My middle name is Dennis, and I fucking <laughs> hate it. I hate it. I'm named after my grandfather who abandoned my family and never helped my mother with anything uh, after she had me. And It's a stupid name. Unrelated to my grandfather. I mean, fuck my grandfather. He's an asshole. Um, but it's a stupid name nonetheless. And my full name sounds stupider, which is not even a word, but it's how I feel when you say it out loud. So I, I, I know you've been giggling about it this whole time. I've been giddy. Yeah, it's fucking <laughs> stupid. So, uh, so Meathead is like asking Dennis's dad for a doctor, and he says, "I'll go call. I'll make a call." And I don't this. I don't get this, Dennis. Starts screaming, pancakes! What? What? (laughs) And then he, slow motion, karate kicks himself over to Meathead. (laughs) What? Like, you have to watch this scene. I'll find a time code. (laughs) He, in slow motion, just like does karate spins and kicks over to Meathead. And then just bites him on the hand. (laughs) And, like, as he bites him on the hand, his eyes widen because, like, I guess he's got, Meathead's got oh, sick man blood now. Yeah. And Dennis's dad immediately realizes what's happened. And in retaliation, is now going to kill Meathead and the rest of the Scooby gang back at the cabin. What? No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Why? That's a thing that's happening. Because they're Why? sick. Because, like, Meathead is very clearly okay. sick. And he his whole, he has this whole, like, the dad is a whole diatribe. He's like... Well, you were sick, and now you got my boy sick. What if the doctors can't fix my boy? So we got a problem, and I got to solve the problem, and I'm going to solve the problem by killing you. (laughs) That's a southern reaction. Yeah, yeah. This is the south. He gets his little gang, he gets a posse of him and two other uh, hillbillies together, and there begins a high-speed truck chase. (laughs) Um, Back at the cabin. Rapist tells Peggy Brunette that he's going to find Douche, and then they're all going to leave because he, quote, can't stay here anymore. Peggy asks him about BFZ, but he doesn't even respond. He just walks off because 
He's just the worst. Again, I'm glad we're, he's just fucking utter garbage the rest of this movie. Yeah, as he um, deserves. Yeah. So Peggy takes a bath, and we see that her back is all chewed up from the hand marks the disease messed the, because this disease, like, the, I'm sorry, sickness, it's not a disease. This sickness messes with your skin, like it makes you break out, and it like kind of sloughs your skin off your body. So yeah. she's got like gross, chewed up handprints on her back. Uh, I, yeah, that's that's basically it. Like, it makes you cough up blood and makes your skin look gross. That's all it really does. It's not, like, really that otherwise damaging. Which, I, I mean, the skin stuff looks gross, but it's not really that... I mean, yeah. Well, I okay. thought it was supposed if, to be, like, a flesh-eating virus. It is. Well, it Larry, doesn't... don't minimize the flesh-eating aspect of the virus. Okay, it's gross. I'm talking... Okay, I'm not talking about if I got it. If I got it, I mean, just fucking shoot me in the head. But I'm talking about for as a horror movie. Like, it's not... Okay. Right, right. There's not, for, it's not a... a horror movie that's trying to that, be a gore yeah. fest... There's not the alien monster <coughs> growing yeah. out of your stomach or something. E- exactly, yeah. Yeah. Like, it's not... Because it's not trying to be, like, a scary horror movie, it's trying to be a gross horror movie... Again, this is what I was saying, They're like, straddling the line, like... Right. The big, the most shockingly gore things that happen, there's, like, one big shocking scene that's going to come up in a bit, and then there's, like, it's just the spitting up blood. It's really not that, like, outrageous. For mm. something, because of what it's trying to be, I expected more outrageous stuff. And it's, it, yeah, I, would I want this disease? Fuck no. I, kill me with cancer instead. This looks horrifying. But, <laughs> in a, the sense of a horror movie... I, I yeah. was not that impressed, you know? Okay, that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, uh, Peggy is in the bath. She's crying and shaving her legs and being an intelligent human being. I know what's going to happen here, and I have not watched the scene that happens, which happens oh, next. Yep. She's shaving her legs. The sound of what happens is gross enough, and I have enough nightmares in my fucking life without having to watch a yep. woman literally shave the skin off her body. Yeah, it's pretty gross. I assume that's what happens. I have yep. never watched it, and I refuse. So you are correct. Yeah. Um. So uh, Meathead's truck dies uh, in the, during the chase, and he runs off into the woods to escape the three hillbillies coming to kill him. Um. Mm. Out looking for Deuce, rapist finds the corpse of the hunter in the water. Okay. This this is the scene I was talking about with the the they this is he's like he sees this corpse in the water. It's it's face down. And I guess he wants to make sure it's the hunter. Clearly, he, he puts two and two together that, oh shit, this is what happened. The water's tainted. Like, he's like, oh my god, that's what happened. He, he, you can see him put that together in his head. He gets yeah. on a shitty wooden ladder. Because this isn't like a, uh, like a little reservoir that like leads to a water tower that leads into the water system. Like, this isn't the river. He gets on, like, a wooden ladder that's attached to the side of this. And, like tries to turn the corpse over to check if it's the hunter and it clearly is and he's all gross (laughs) dead and then the fucking ladder breaks and he falls onto the corpse into the water oh fuck's sake if you see a corpse if you let's say in a different scenario you kill me or or anyone let's say you don't let's say you and I kill my neighbor let me not say that loudly (laughs) let's say (laughs) you and I kill somebody from Texas and you're running through the woods and you see a fucking corpse in the water. Do you turn it over to see if it's the Texan? No, you can make a logical jump there and not have to look at the face. So he falls into the water. He's completely drenched. He falls on top of the corpse, which is another fucking nightmare. I didn't need to have in my life as me (laughs) on top of a corpse. Um, Anyway, so uh, Peggy Burnett runs outside with her legs all razored up. She's trying to get to the shed. I don't remember. Why. I'm, I'm honestly not sure why. But um, Dr. Mambo, yes, the dog that's been lurking around that they've just entirely forgotten about, <coughs> excuse me, catches up to her as she's desperately trying to escape. By She's like trying to get into the shed so she can escape. And um, uh, so, yeah, uh, that we, we, the scene cuts away. We see rapist running back to the house. And he finds that Dr. Mambo uh, has torn Peggy Burnett to pieces. So, so she's the first one to die. Peggy Burnett is the uh, first one to die. And I not even of up. the disease she had, the sickness, she dies from... From Dr. Mambo. Dr. Mambo. So wow. you had her as fourth. Yeah, so I know. Incorrect. Um, 
Yeah, and so then, uh, so he he continues on. Rapist does, and he goes to the shed where we see that uh, this Doctor Mambo is eating the intestines of Blondie Friendzone. Um, As you do, and then he proceeds to finally shoot Doctor Mambo in the face, which is two dog deaths in this movie, and I hate it. Is Blondie Friendzone still alive, just with her intestines half eaten? Yes, she is. We'll get to that. Nice. In a second. Um, the. He the 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 gun he has is a BB gun, and this is where right, so the power of the BB gun suddenly suddenly again it comes can kill question. a dog. You cannot kill a dog with a BB gun unless you shoot it in the eye socket. <gasps> Did I tell you about my dog's elbow? Oh my god, Isaac! Don't tell me. <laughs> I happened? didn't shoot the dog. I promise you. What happened? To your okay, dog? okay. So we adopted the dog um, like two years ago now, and she got del- sent up from the south, from like one of the Carolinas, because they have too many dogs. We don't have enough dogs. Whatever. So we adopted her. My dog's and, from Florida, so I can't talk. <laughs> um, and event, we just, like, we're feeling around, and, like, her elbow, there is, like, this weird little, we thought was, like, a bone chip. Mm-hmm. Like, maybe, I don't know, like, a ankle spur or something. Uh, or heel spur, whatever it is. It was just kind of the thing that moved around, and we figured it was a little fragment of bone, and maybe she had an injury from before. But it didn't seem to cause her any pain or distress. She was walking fine, so we didn't really think about it. But then the next time we went to the vet... We asked about it, and the vet started feeling around and said, oh, that's probably a BB. And wow. once once we thought of that, it's, oh, yeah, that's very obviously round and BB-sized. So our dog got shot in the south with a BB and now has the BB in her elbow forever. Wow. Jeez. So, yeah. But it, it didn't kill her. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, So I whenever I need to hurt. kill the dog, I can't just shoot her with a BB. Wow. Jesus Christ. Isaac... If I if I have to if if there's if there's a nuclear holocaust and she's starting to mutate, I'll put her out of her misery. But I can't use a BB gun. Yeah, yeah, I, BB guns are pretty. I've been shot by them. They're not. They they hurt. But I mean, do you have a BB in your elbow? No. Do you want one? <laughs> are you gonna take it to your dog and then plant it in me? <laughs> sure. Okay. Sorry, we got off track. <laughs> I gotta take my shirt off. It's so fucking hot. I just stall. I take my headphones off. You're you're just getting aroused by all this BB and dog uh, talk. God, I'm gonna fucking die fat and sweaty. Oh, it's the worst. Does anyone die a different way? <sighs> I assume. I guess if you starve to, to death. death. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that too. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, so Blondie friend zone. Uh, Doctor Mambo is eating her intestines. Uh, rapist kills Doctor Mambo. Rest in peace, Doctor Mambo. Um, but Blondie friend zone survived the attack. And rolls over to look at Rapist, showing that her face is melted off, mostly, from right. the uh, sickness. And this is a thing, This is their big gross-out scene, because they play, like, really dramatic, intense music. And, like, if you go to the IMDB, you can see what her face looks like. Like, it's one of the featured pictures. It's pretty gross, because, like, her jaw's exposed, which I think that's gross. But, I mean, yeah, again, yeah, it's not, like, the grossest thing I've ever seen in my life. Um, right. So, whatever. But, uh, uh, where was I? Sorry, I switched to look at the picture. Um... Yeah, so the rapist, uh, in an act of quote unquote mercy, mercy kills her by what do you what do you think? How do you think he mercy kills her? Does he shoot her with a BB gun? No, he beats her to death with a shovel. <laughs> oh, oh God! He does in fact have a goddamn gun, which we now know is powerful enough to kill a dog. Could have shot his ten year love that he raped in the head and ended it far quicker, but no. Right. And she's already bleeding to death. So, Beat her to death with a fucking shovel. How many whacks with the shovel? Uh, several. It cuts away. He's still damn. going. Damn. Damn. More than five. God damn. Yeah. Yeah. That's intense. I wouldn't beat to death someone I didn't like with a shovel. Yeah. I don't know so, if I'll go all the way in that direction with you, but... <laughs> yeah, I would too. Uh... So Rapist is packing up to leave when Meathead shows up, warning Rapist about the approaching hillbillies. The two set up a trap, which is the fucking most scooby dooiest of traps in the world. When the hillbillies arrive, uh, they open the door, and uh, Meathead is, like, sitting there with the gun pointed at him, the BB gun that has indeterminate power, and he, like, says a one-liner, but immediately gets shot in the head and killed. So Meathead is our third <laughs> person to go. And again, well, another fuck. person. Uh, no one has died of the sickness yet. <laughs> Right, yeah. <laughs> Except no one, literally no one in this movie has died of this, the flesh-eating sickness. Um, so yeah, uh, he gets shot in the head, and then um, 
rapist surprises him and like clangs one of the uh, hillbillies uh, in the head with like a fucking uh, 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 fire poker or something. And then that guy's gun goes off and he shoots Dennis's dad in the stomach with a with a shotgun. Uh. Um, and the third hillbilly is like a big dopey looking bald guy who's got a box. There's like something where he's got a, a, a kit, a kid killing kit. It never goes anywhere. I'm not going to bother fucking going into it. Whatever. Okay. And um, he gets stabbed in the ear with a screwdriver, so he's dead. And then oh, uh, Dennis's dad is crawling away, and he gets... Uh, rapist finishes him off. So Rapist, who he, Meathead, and Douche could not take out a sick 50-year-old hunter, but he's managed to kill three fully armed adult men <laughs> with relative ease. Right. Um, whatever. So yep. Rapist runs off looking for Douche. Uh, he's like screaming, it's in the water, don't drink the water, there's blood in the water, I hate Dave Matthews. Uh, and in a cave, he finds the half-eaten remains of Grimm, the weed guy from earlier. Oh, okay. Why the fuck is he in the movie? What's the fucking point? Why was Grimm here? What, uh, like I said, me. if he's a red herring, what is the fucking point? We, <laughs> we don't need him to introduce Dr. Mambo, because if you remember the scene I complained about five minutes into the movie, where, like, um... Rapist was washing his hand from Dennis biting him, and the two dogs came up to him, and he was, like, petting up on dogs. This fucking mountain's covered in dogs. We didn't need to introduce Dr. Mambo as a villain and have Grimm be there to fucking make Dr. Mambo have a point to be there. So it's just, right. it's just time-wasted. He adds nothing. Pointless. I hate it. Um, <laughs> just padding. So Rapist comes across the hillbilly's truck, and here we go again. I don't understand. Like, th- this is where, like, I think the comedy... Eli Roth is like, shit, I didn't make this funny. I gotta make it funny to be a comedy. <laughs> um, he runs into a deer with the truck. And in the most ridiculous scene so far, the deer's front two legs get stuck inside the windshield and are, like, oh, flapping around. And it's, like, terrible animatronic, like, just one step above Chuck E. Cheese legs. And they're, like, smacking him and smacking the truck and the deer's screaming. And eventually he gets the gun of indeterminate strength and shoots the deer and the deer, very obvious deer puppet, falls off the truck. Uh, so the truck's dead. Um, he Rapist is now covered in his blood and deer blood and hillbilly blood. He stumbles off into the night. And eventually he ends up in a big gathering with a bunch of hippies and Deputy Wilson. Or, uh, sorry, Deputy Winston, uh, who tells Rapist he totally forgot to call the tow truck. Now, let's say you and me and a bunch of hippies uh, are out in the woods with a cop drinking beer and smoking weed and playing harmonica. And um, a guy walks up out of the woods covered in blood asking for help you think you'd be a little perturbed right yeah i'd be concerned these hippies are just like whoa man what's what's up with you and winston is like ah shit the party man i forgot to get your tow truck you had a bad night he's fucking covered in blood you dumbass party man. <laughs> um so yeah uh a call comes over the radio for winston that says like hey there's a bunch of kids that are sick they're causing all kinds of trouble they've got some bad disease shoot on sight I don't know how they got this information. Yeah. Whatever. So Winston's right. told I, to shoot on sight. Uh, and the hippies are all like, dude, shoot him. He's fucking crazy. He's covered in blood. Shoot him. But Winston forgot his gun in the cop car because he's a terrible cop. That Winston is not a mystery. He's just a shitty cop. That's that's it. That's Why did we have an air of mystery about him before? He's just a terrible cop. <laughs> it's not in my house. That was a loud it's probably man. Winston. It's here to make me the party man. Um... <laughs> I'm not wearing pants, so I don't think I'm going to open the door to check. Uh, if you're uh, not wearing pants, you're the party man. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, the two of the hip, two of the hippies go to, like, accost um, rapist, because they're, they're trying to kill him now at this point. And uh, he ends up in a fight with him. <clears throat> he punches a harmonica down one guy's throat. Oh, come on. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's not what happens. I'm sorry. Uh, the one hippie tries to hit him with a guitar, and he ducks it. Because sick people have the incredible power of ducking stuff th- in this whole movie. So the guy with the guitar hits the harmonica down the other guy's throat. So oh, he's, God. like, doing the thing where he's gasping and making harmonica sounds. Oh, God I imagine God. people thought it was funny. I thought it was stupid. Um, yeah. Uh. And the other guy, rapist, backs him up into a car and just vomits blood down his throat. Because that's just disgusting. Um, <laughs> and then uh, the hippies all leave. And Winston's like, ah, oh, what the fuck? You ruined the party, party man. So Rapist knocks him on the head and leaves him. And then just runs off into the woods. <coughs> um, so eventually he collapses in the street. And a truck picks him up and drops him off at the hospital. While there, <coughs> he's hallucinating, I think. Because he's like, there's this scene where he's on the gurney. 
and the camera's over top of him. And, um, excuse me, so sorry. Uh, he's going past rooms, and he sees a guy in a rabbit suit performing surgery on a woman. Because what? Eli Roth thinks he's fucking Stanley Kubrick, that piece of right, shit. Right, yeah, yeah. So dumb. In the credits, the rabbit is credited as We'll Never Tell. Which just, oh, it's ew, fucking, ew. it's, it reeks of pretension. Seriously. Like, get your head out of your fucking head. Nobody cares about your ten, uh, I'm sorry, two second rabbit scene, you fucking hack. <laughs> it's just artistic bullshit. I hate it. it. It doesn't add anything. It doesn't make you clever. Um, so the rapist flashes back to the good times he had with Blondie friend zone, like walking in the woods, kissing uh, that time he forcibly raped her against her knowledge and will. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's just me remembering it. Silly me. <laughs> um, the doctors tell the cops they can't treat rapist here. He has to move to the county hospital. The cop says he'll handle it. And uh, we see a bandaged up Deputy Winston has rapist in the back of his car and is uh, taking rapist to be taken good care of, quote unquote, because the party's not over for rapist. Uh, and rapist is like trying to warn Winston about the water, but Winston's too fucking dense to understand. In fairness, he's also been hit in the head by this guy, so you know, whatever. Um, the next morning, douche, who is totally fine, returns to the cabin to find that everyone is dead. And in a stunning revolutionary move, he raises his arms in victory as what? he has survived and he was right. Because you recall, his last words to them were, I'm right and you're wrong. You're going to die and I'm going to live. And honestly, if I was right about a plague and I survived, I'd be doing the same thing. <laughs> he does a lot of like yelling about, I was right. I survived. Where I'd be doing the dickheaded thing of being like, oh, I told you so. Who listens to Larry? Nobody. Now look, I'm alive. <laughs> so I can't really hold him at fault here because I would definitely have a moment of, yeah, I was right, motherfuckers. He's an asshole about it. And like is shouting to the heavens like, I made it. I lived. And he's on the porch and he's like, hands up to God and just gets riddled with bullets and dies instantly. <laughs> uh, As the police have arrived to clean up the mess. Right. Um, they burn all the corpses and we see that Winston has dumped rapist's body by the river where the sickness has now flowed into the entire water supply. So Winston basically has now led to the death of the entire world. <laughs> because nice. as we see, we get a bunch of scenes of kids using river water to make lemonade. Um, a uh, spring okay. water truck pulls away from town. Um, so yeah, the order of deaths. The official order of our characters' deaths. Blondie friend zone. is uh, this. I'm sorry, this is what you said. You mm -hmm. had it as blondie friend zone, meathead, douche peggy brunette protagonist in actuality it was peggy brunette blondie friend zone meathead protagonist douche so you are zero out of five damn i'm disappointed in myself yeah yeah i expected better i expected to get at least one right the, the blonde picking the blonde first was a was a uh, shrewd move though i had done yeah, that i knew too. she got sick first yeah she definitely got and sick. and i knew first. i knew douche and rapist survived the longest yes i just forgot how they died and exactly when they died mm -hmm. no one in this movie dies from getting sick because <laughs> <laughs> winston kills rapist and just throws his body by the river because he's a terrible cop no yeah. one dies from getting sick no one that's pretty funny yeah i i, I don't know if that's intentional but or he just it's gotta know. be I, I'll, yeah. I'll give Roth credit on that. That's pretty good. It's, it's fine. I don't really have an opinion one or the other. I just thought it was kind of interesting yeah. to note. So we get the last interaction in the movie now. So all our main characters are dead. Here comes Dennis. Here is my theory. Not Dennis. Oh, I thought it'd it. be Dennis too. <laughs> I'm going let, to... Let's spoil this part now. We never know what starts the disease. We never know. Mm -hmm. The f okay. dead dog is the start. That's it. It just comes from nowhere. Which now we'll bring up too... The when we there was the scene I talked about where the kids see the lady slaughtering a pig, and the pig is all sick inside. Yeah. What? Just the, I mean, again, it's a horror movie. It doesn't really matter. Like it's not meant right, to matter. Yeah. I don't really care that it doesn't matter. But like, why was the pig sick? Yeah. Why do we have that scene? Just make the disease come out of nowhere. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to matter. It, it right, doesn't need yeah. an explanation. It's 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 a movie that's about. Kids died from getting their flesh eaten and shot and fucking and, you know, wh whatever. Who cares? So it just, it, it just, more padding. Like, that, my biggest complaint about this movie was the padding. There's a lot of 
really just doesn't add suspense or mystery or anything. It just pads the runtime. Anyway, no more Dennis. I'm sorry. We get one final gag. And uh, we see the old the, the cops come up to kids who have made lemonade with river water. And they're talking to the old man with the suspenders from before. And we see a bunch of very clearly rap scene inner city black gentlemen and women walk walk into scene. It's overlaid by 90s hip hop as they're walking up in a kind of a swagger. Excuse me. And the old man uh, hurriedly walks inside while there's tense music playing. And the group gets into the store where the old man is like trying to really quickly pull the rifle off the wall. And the music gets out to a point. And as the music crescendos, he presents him with the rifle and says he's fixed and polish it. And then the rap kicks back in and he says, what's up, my (laughs) N-words? And they all slap hands. And he wasn't racist after all. And oh. <laughs> I thought that was great. Because <laughs> you know what? That is the that gag is the reason this whole movie was made. That's pretty good. Because uh, that doesn't mean anything. It's <laughs> the five kids in the entire world died just for that joke. <laughs> oh my god, that's glorious. It's it's fantastic. You know what? Ooh. And nowadays it's cliched. But, man, it is great. It's because, again, credit where it's due, I did not expect that and (laughs) completely forgot about it. (laughs) It never would. Oh, my God. Right, right. Because at that point, the the plot's done. It's just like, it's that's like an after credits (laughs) Marvel scene. (laughs) Oh, shit. And and that's it. And, And, like, they're all, they all slap hands and they're shooting the shit. And after that, like, a band of... A good old boys with on fiddles and guitars and whatnot, and the the rap gang are all hanging out in front of the store, and they sing away the movie with some like banging fiddle music. <laughs> that's that's the best ending of a movie we've had. That's the it's, best ending of any movie I've ever seen. It's really good, and like, I, I did not remember that at all. I really think like <laughs> he had that joke, and he knew he wanted to write a horror movie. Because, like, everything in the middle with the rapist and Meathead and all of them is just to make you forget about this setup. (laughs) Yeah. It's just to throw you (laughs) off the scent that he is going to not shoot them. Because you expect that because the hillbillies chasing Meathead, all that is for this. (laughs) It's all for the what up, my N-word joke. (laughs) Which, really, like, that, that puts this movie, it's almost, that almost makes it okay. Yeah, I, I mean yeah. that's really it. Like, I, I don't have much more to say. I've kind of there wasn't really anything for me to add. Uh, again, like, I think the Rotten Tomatoes review is spot on. Like, it's it's in the middle. It's not a horror movie. It, it, really, it's not really a comedy. It doesn't really know what it is, and it makes so many homages. It doesn't really do anything particular. I think a couple jokes are great. I think that last joke is a fucking ten out of ten. It's gold. But yeah, it's a horror movie, and the bar for them is just so much lower because it, it really, you don't, yeah, it, it sounds a lot like someone's first movie who who really loves movies and is thrilled to be a movie maker, and they're trying to do too much and sort of stretch themselves thin. But you can see the raw talent there for someone's just, first movie. Yeah. It's really good. I want to see more of his other stuff because I, I never saw Hostel. I know horror people really liked that. Yeah, Hostel. I know is. Well, loved. heard good things about it. It sounds terrifying. And yeah, I, don't, I won't be watching so. it. Please don't make me watch it. But yeah, I'm. I don't know. I, I you you've made me hate this movie less than I used to because I had this big yeah. animosity toward it just from I having think, seen it. But again, I was 14, so mm-hmm. I think the context uh, I, of this show helps a lot too. Yeah, because that watched, is true. This is easily the best movie I've had to watch for this show. Like I, I could, I almost yeah, and I sort of had. I had that with uh, Cirque du Freak um, last week, where it it really was bad, but especially in the beginning when there was the era of mystery, it was fun. It was really fun, and I, I enjoyed that mm-hmm. fun aspect of it. And, it, you know, it wasn't a perfect movie, but I, I don't know, sort of realized the stuff that was broken about it wasn't that big a deal, and I yeah. could get into it, and then eventually it just fell to pieces. But Like, there but was yeah. stuff, yeah, I'm sorry, I cut you off, go ahead. No, that, that, that's basically it. There was 
a lot, like, pretty much every review that I've had so far that's coming to my memory, there was something about the plot that really upset me, like, just to show how badly it was written. Mostly, when I was watching this movie, I was just bored. Like, yeah. I wasn't scared. Like, I had, I, my friends basically held me down and made me watch Insidious, which apparently real horror fans say is shit, but it's full of jump scares, and I scare terribly easily. Right. I, I, I was terrified the whole time. Because it's just fucking scary faces and loud music and jumps and screams yeah. and shit. And the well, we, fucking uh, high-speed smile is going to haunt me for the rest of my night, my nightmares for the rest of my life. But this was not scary. Like, I was just bored. It was nothing really happening. Like, it's all stereotypes. But there was... The comedy was, at points, okay. So, mm-hmm. like, was this movie good? No, I didn't like it. It sucked. But in the context of the show, it's pretty good. Right. And again, for someone's first speaking. movie... Compared to other people's first movies, I thought it was pretty damn good. Like that's a good yeah. Uh, effort. Yeah, so. and I think he was really young because I don't. I think he's like forty now. So I think he was in his. He was younger than us now when he made this. I think. Wow, really? I think he was in his twenties, possibly like mid early twenties. Yeah, he wrote it in ninety five, and he was born in seventy two. Okay, I'm a little off, but still, yeah. he well. Yeah, when it came out in 2002, he was, it was 30 when it hit theaters. So Yeah, and he wrote it when so, he was 23. Yeah, that's impressive. I mean, I, you, you and I are, you know, I think 6 out of 10 talented writers, at least. Uh, you're better than that, your best day. I, I might be a 6 and a half out of 10 on my best day. So, Beer, like, I on, think you. we could write a movie probably as good, if not better, than this with no training. Uh, for first, yeah, so, I don't know where I'm going with that, but it's it's not bad. For what it is, it's not bad. Okay. I don't think it was good, but I don't think it was horrible, mm. which well, I that... thought about pretty much every other movie I've reviewed besides Grand Mo- Grand Mossy just sucked. The rest of them were yeah. horrible. Yeah. And this one just was kind of just dull. I well, thought, was... I, I'm honestly, I'm glad we had a good back and forth. I thought this review was going to suck. I thought I was going to just have nothing to talk about. It, 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 yeah, it was interesting. And it, it, interesting to see... Um... And sort of the same again with Cirque du Freak last week, where there was part of it I liked, or I, I, I had that weird relationship of liking it and hating it, and just, instead of just, like, Perfect Sisters, where it's shit the entire way through. Yes. It's interesting to see, oh, well, this stuff really works, this stuff really doesn't, and, like, you start really piecing together what makes a movie work and what really uh, grinds it to a halt. Mm-hmm. And just from, yeah, like you said, like, we both have dabbled in writing and have accomplished nothing because we're terrible people. Yeah. But that's really fascinating from a, a creative perspective of, like, it's like little dials you turn just a, a little bit that will completely run it off the rails. Mm-hmm. Like, doing this show and, and doing other iterations and stuff like this show, it's really, like, made me appreciate good writing in movies a lot more. Yeah, it's just hard. Being able and, to yeah, see we... like the stuff that's uh, going into it, and and then trying to do your best, like knowing this is going to suck, mm. but trying to extrapolate what you can to talk about it out of it's really opened my eyes to like a lot of stuff in screenwriting and just regular writing. It's it's very fascinating. Yeah, and it's 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 easy to talk shit about movies, but to really, I don't know, to to get everything right, everything clicking on the right cylinders is is. is unbelievably difficult and that's why movies are so hard to make oh and yeah and the, the, the other tougher thing i think about movies than even a novel as hard as writing a novel would be is there's so many hands in the pot because you write it but then the director is interpreting it and then whoever's editing the movie puts their spin on it and they can fuck it up and yeah. then it's depend it's dependent on the actors and the producers involved with everything and makeup and costumes and set design all this stuff can just you know, shoot a good script in the ass. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, an example that from you and my history, uh, Pootie Tang was a movie written by right. Louis C.K., who, putting everything aside, and this is something we knew about before any allegations came out, um, a talented writer, the man is. Yes, uh, he is a comedic genius. Yeah, very much so. A bit of an asshole. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, but he wrote the movie Pootie Tang, which is a pile of utter shit, and I fucking come at me i've watched it four times uh <laughs> and like he he talked about how like that was the thing like he when he, they, he first wrote it he thought you know this isn't the best thing in the world but it's not bad and it just got just too many hands in the pot it's ex- that was exactly what it was, it was just too much shit happened to it and it really it kind of makes you empathetic because you know i over exaggerated smidge not not much sadly not much i really am this manic in real life for like the sake of comedy for this show but you know 
I can't imagine the pressure of writing a movie and then having people, assholes like me, look at it and be like, ah, this shot doesn't make any sense. Right, yeah. And, you know, stuff yeah. like that. Like, it, it, if you've written a movie and got it on Netflix, well, you're already a million times fucking better than me who I do license plates for a living. I fucking made sandwiches for ten years, which are fine yeah. professions, but, you know, I don't have movies on Netflix. I'm not, other people aren't talking about the shit I've done, so... At the same time, the Waynes brothers exist, so... People say that the Wayne who writes the stuff, I can't remember which one, they all blend together in my head, just because the names are all very similar to me. They say he's really talented, but I've yet to see any evidence of it. I have I have something in my back pocket I might pull the trigger on. I don't know if I will, but... No. You might it's be going to Wayne's movie. country again. No, it's not. Okay. And I, I watched... Oh, Okay, we, we gotta stop, because I can't give away too much. Yeah, it, yeah, it's a save it for, for later. the future or next episode, whatever that is. But yeah. Your, but your yeah, next it's... movie I have picked out, it's, it's gonna be interesting, because you like the original. Oh, no. You really like the original. Oh, is it a sequel or a remake? It's a, it's a sequel. Oh, fuck me! I know. Alright, well, on that lovely note, we'll leave it... Oh, here. God, I, I think, think I know what it is. That. Oh, we'll no! See. We'll see. We'll see. But, uh, yeah, so this is episode 13. Next week we'll be back for episode 14. I will be discussing the movie I'm in Love with a Church Girl, a Christian romantic comedy starring one Mr. Ja Rule. Those words just don't sound right. Christian romantic comedy. Like, those three things cannot possibly be intertwined. Yeah, starring Mr. Ja Rule. (laughs) I'm sorry, four things. Yeah, it's like... uh, an. Antarctic sex exploration starring Hitler and the Queen of England. <laughs> well, like, you know the Nazis are hiding in Antarctica. So really, yeah, you've you got two, two of those pieces fit together, man. I've and you know the Queen of England, it. man. Back in the day, fuck like a champ. Do you know the Queen of England would have been legally fuckable while Hitler was alive? Yeah. She was born in 1926. She was 19 when Hitler supposedly killed himself. We all know he's still alive in Antarctica. Yeah. It's fucking true. Princess Diana. Oh, no, she's fucking dead. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't miss. She's fucking dead. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, <laughs> thank you for listening to the Bowels of Netflix. We had a good time. We hope you did, too. Uh, if you want to send us a tweet or poke us on Facebook, those are both at Bowels of Netflix. If you want to send us an email, that's Bowels of Netflix at gmail.com. Uh, you should also rate and subscribe on whatever podcast apparatus you're using and recommend us to your friends because, uh, yeah, we're just doing this for fun right now, but we'd really like to get some more listeners and, yeah, just, I don't know, get this really kickstarted and have it be a, have a thing that we do for the next ten years until one of us dies very tragically and then yeah. is embarrassed and their families are very embarrassed at their funeral while the other one plays horrible clips from this show. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, when one of us uh, gets a horrible sickness from hobo water and then dies by, like, choking on a grape. <laughs> That'd be a good way to go, choking on a grape. Uh, uh, another quick shout-out, too, to Kevin Macleod from Incompetech.com. He uh, writes all the music we use, so you can go check out his website. There's full links in the description of the episode. Good shit. But if yeah, you have a creative project you're working on, you could pull some stuff. It's all royalty-free. You just got to give him credit for it. Um, but, yeah, make sure to stop by next week because... We're, we're going to fall in love with the church girl, you and me, Larry. That's what I we're going to do. I don't think that's possible oh, for me. It's possible. I think, I'm, I think I've strayed a little too far from the uh, blood of the lamb at this point well, in my life. The Lord's arms will welcome you back via the prophet of Ja Rule. <laughs> the gospel of Ja Rule <laughs> coming to you in episode what, fucking 14. <laughs> yeah. Oh. If we survive that far. Oh, one can only hope we don't. All right. Thanks for listening. We'll see you. Smell you later. <laughs>